Robert Sang is from West Bay Nephrology and is board certified in nephrology and internal medicine. Dr. Sang received his undergraduate degree at University of Maryland and his medical degree at Drexel University School of Medicine in Philadelphia. He served his internship, residency, and fellowship at University of California, Davis. Dr. Sang is also <coughs> medical director at DeVita, Davis City. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Robert Sang. So I uh, just wanted to give you a guideline in terms of uh, uh, my, my talk. Uh, I want to go over a little bit about dialysis and the history of dialysis. Then I want to discuss the, the uh, epidemic and the pandemic of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. Then I'm going to focus my talk on in-center hemodialysis. We'll discuss briefly the principles, um, basics on the equipment, access, that is the lifeline of a uh, person's uh, dialysis. And then also briefly run over uh, what an in-center, for those who are not uh, in-center hemodialysis patients, patient, uh, what in-center hemodialysis looks like and feel, feels like. And then also talk about uh, clinical standards that we all try to adhere to in order to improve our patient's outcomes. Uh, then I'll just end with a little bit on um, sort of what the trends are you know, as we progress towards the 21st century, the second decade of, of, of uh, the 21st century. First of all, this is a reprint of uh, an 1828 uh, German textbook. And this is a, 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 a diagram from Tibet 3,000 years ago. And then 3,000 year years ago, the, the uh, uh, people, uh, in that civilization knew how important the kidneys were, how they're the center of the, uh, the body and universe. Now here, uh, just to move uh, forward in time, this is the original uh, cough dialyzer. So uh, we just hit our 50th anniversary uh, in terms of uh, dialysis. Uh, and uh, and uh, this is uh, a picture I, I found uh, to sort of show people what it looks like. And now, uh, regarding uh, mo more modern times, uh, we have, uh, in general, hollow fiber dialyzers, as you can tell there. Um, there are various brands on the market. Uh, they, there used to be flat plate di dialyzers, but that sort of has uh, moved towards the wayside. This, is, this happens to be a Fresenius machine. So uh, again, um, I would say it's probably the industry leader, but not the only choice in the market. So I wanted to just uh, to talk about Dr. William Call, the founder of uh, the dialysis machine, real briefly. Uh, as you may or may not have uh, known, he passed away a couple of years ago at the age, uh, right age of 97. And I wanted to share some uh, information about it. So he, uh, he is known for creating the dialysis machine, but he was also uh, someone who actually created the first blood bank in Europe during World War II in his native country, Holland. In fact, uh, he saved over 800 lives because he uh, housed uh, approximately 800 uh, people in Holland of Jewish descent in order to avoid uh, uh, <coughs> Nazi genocide for, for those individuals. Um, he originally wanted to be a zookeeper, but his father talked him out of it, <laughs> saying that uh, being a physician has better job prospects, something that's uh, something relevant uh, these days. He was actually, before the, the terminology was known, he was actually dyslexic. But he uh, you know, did very well for himself and for, for the world. And then, uh, he, as I mentioned before, he's from Holland originally, but he immigrated to the U.S. in 1950. And as I mentioned also before, he passed away in 2009. Um, uh, here in the U.S. at 97. But I wanted to share also briefly uh, something uh, about uh, how he sort of thought about discovering the dialysis machine. He actually, during World War II, he witnessed uh, a 22-year-old man die of kidney failure. And he thought, well, you know, how can I help people in the future with kidney failure? And he basically thought about different ways of uh, creating a uh, an artificial kidney, as they're, they're called. But um, 
he basically uh, wound up getting a salvaged old Ford car and metal pieces from a uh, down German fighter plane and somehow over time created the, uh, a dialysis machine. And, and the, the other ironic thing was even though he helped um, uh, a lot of people of Jewish descent, uh, he, the first person that he saved uh, in World War II from kidney failure was, was actually a Nazi collaborator in Holland. He did get a lot of um, pushback, but, uh, but he, his opinion was that he, he's a physician, he's here to heal, and uh, no matter what their background uh, was, and despite all the uh, controversy it caused back in the day. So let's talk about end-stage renal disease real briefly and why it's so important uh, these days, from a, both from a societal level and from a world level. Uh, this is uh, data from the USRDS 2010. So this is uh, data from a couple of years ago. That's the latest uh, information available about new dialysis patients, so incident dialysis patients. Um, the, the top line uh, is, uh, is to, uh, total dialysis. Uh, the second line, right next to it, is in, uh, hemodialysis, whether in center. Uh, and um, uh, they, they, I don't think they've broken that down to home hemo, but uh, but uh, that would be very close. Basically, uh, in the U.S., about 92% of patients who require renal replacement therapy uh, are choose hemodialysis. And uh, down here is a peritoneal dialysis and transplant uh, is a, a, a lower bar. And in terms of prevalent dialysis patients, the total amount of patients who require renal replacement therapy of some sort, uh, you can see here the numbers are pretty large. Uh, right now, uh, as of uh, two and a half years ago, there are 354,000 people in the U.S. that need uh, Hem uh, hemo or choose hemodialysis. For peritoneal dialysis, there are 26,500 uh, or so uh, that uh, are on peritoneal dialysis. 165,000 people uh, have a kidney transplant. And then uh, people on the wait list, uh, a very large number. Okay, so here I just, uh, just focus on the colors here. Basically, I wanted to show you the change in incidence, again, new dialysis starts, and then uh, from 1998 to 2008. So the darker the color, the more people with end-stage renal disease or end-stage kidney disease. So this is 1998. This is just 12 years ago. Here is um, 2008. Uh, as you can tell, um, a lot darker, meaning a lot more people with kidney failure and requiring dialysis or transplant. Now, um, the question is, wow, you know, that's quite a difference in 12 years. It can't be just genetic and, and, uh, and sort of, you know, what I got from my parents or my parents' parents and so forth. Uh, but it is pretty drastic. And here, just a prevalent patient. So the number of people on dialysis that have been on dialysis, not new starts here. You can see uh, quite a difference in uh, color. Uh, you know, the technology is getting better, so people are living longer. Uh, the mortality rate uh, has come down, but um, it is going to be um, challenging for a society in the future as time progresses. It has to also do with the twin epidemic of diabetes and obesity. So, so not just the genetic predisposition, but societally uh, what is happening uh, regarding the highest risk factor, which is diabetes, um, the second highest risk factor, which is hypertension, high blood pressure, then of course obesity has, uh, uh, brings on diabetes for many patients. Uh, this is just the, uh, this is a brief slide on, you know, why people have kidney failure in the U.S. So you can see diabetes, hypertension, glomerulonephritis, so these are individuals with lupus or autoimmune diseases attacking their kidneys, so the body attacks their kidneys, and then uh, their kidney uh, fail to the point where they need dialysis. And then uh, uh, also very common uh, is an autosomal dominant uh, polycystic kidney disease, so people with cysts that grow and take over the normal kidney parenchyma, kidney tissue, uh, and thereby causing kidney failure. Um, 
Actually, they do have a great support system here in the U.S. Uh, they have actually one of the strongest, the autosomal dominant polycystic kidney uh, disease uh, patients really have a tight network uh, of support here in the U.S. So uh, if you do have polycystic kidney disease, uh, you should uh, uh, look it up and, and take part. So uh, just to show you that it's not a U.S. specific problem, um, take a look here. Actually, Taiwan, where I originally was born, uh, uh, has the number one uh, um, prevalence of end-stage renal disease, the number of dialysis patients per population. Uh, very small country, but a lot of di dialysis patients. Japan also, okay, and then the U.S. is actually third. And then you see a variety of other countries down here. Um, now, in terms of the incidence, again, new dialysis patients. Um, Taiwan is still number one, but the U but U.S. is coming close, unfortunately. And then the rest of the world. So, I um, wanted to talk to you about uh, dialysis modality choices. And uh, this is just a pictorial of PD, uh, home hemo, and incentive hemo. Of course, we must not forget transplanting. Not uh, there. That would be, uh, in my opinion, I think the best choice for those who are candidates for kidney transplant. Due to, you know, if they meet medical criteria, uh, they should uh, definitely get listed. Uh, just as an aside, uh, uh, like real estate, uh, it's in the Bay Area. It's very unfavorable in the sense for people waiting for a kidney transplant because the wait list is the longest in the nation, uh, five to seven years, depending on your blood type. So get listed early, look into uh, living donor transplant, double list. There are also other programs like kidney swaps uh, available for those who want to give you a kidney, but maybe don't match up blood type wise. So there are a lot of different options uh, in my opinion to look into a transplant. Okay, so let's talk about end center hemodialysis. Um, just to run down, as you can tell there, uh, traditional hemodialysis, this is what we've uh, been doing for, I'd say, at least uh, 30 years since sort of it became the standard, uh, three sessions per week, uh, typically three to four hours per session, uh, sometimes a little longer, sometimes shorter. Uh, here in the Bay Area, there also has been a lot of uh, uh, research on short daily dialysis in the center. So in fact, uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. George Ting, has been actively involved uh, in um, doing clinical research regarding this particular modality. So a person would typically receive five to seven sessions per week of hemodialysis. So they would go to the center, and then they would get their uh, uh, blood cleaned out, so to speak, uh, one and a half to two and a half hours. But they would come in uh, almost on a daily basis. So, uh, so there are some clinical benefits that, uh, that um, are promising based on studies, um, but it is five to seven times per uh, week, um, especially with Bay Area traffic, it can be tough. And then, of course, nocturnal uh, in center hemodynamics, sorry to hear. Um, uh, due to logistics, we typically offer three sessions per week. Now, um, my daily city unit, where I'm the medical director of that particular unit, offers uh, uh, nocturnal hemodialysis. Um, it is a, uh, you know, different people do it for different reasons. Oftentimes people are working or people like the slower, gentler dialysis. It is uh, three times per week in the center. And again, home hemodialysis wise, one can do it more often. Uh, eight, six to eight hours per session. Uh, it's a lot of time commitment, but there are some. Um, promising clinical, um, clinical studies uh, showing potential superiority to the traditional model of three times a week, shorter dialysis, um, you know, get in, get out. Okay, so this is just a um, uh, basic uh, hemodialysis circuit. And uh, since the kidneys don't work, uh, we, we have the hollow fiber dialyzer at the center. This is sort of the artificial kidney. These days, there are different materials that the dialyzer can be made of. Uh, traditionally, it used to be a compound called cellulose. Then uh, they discovered some problems with cellulose, and they 
did a uh, substitute cellulose. Uh, subsequently, uh, we went biosynthetic, basically synthetic, excuse me. Um, and that's probably most of the uh, dialyzer here, dialyzers here in the U.S. Uh, the dialyzers have also, since coughs did, they've gotten smaller in size, but they've got become more efficient. So um, here's the machine. Um, you know, the water is very important. Uh, we typically use heparin. So basically, the the blood would a patient's blood uh, would run from the typically a, a, a fistula or graft, so-called shunt. Uh, it would run into the machine, go through the pump, so the blood pump, where it would, uh, through diffusion and convection, it would be uh, the, the, the couple of things that the dialyzer, the artificial kidney does, removes ex excess fluid, especially if you're doing three times a week. Anything you put in, especially if you have no kidney function, um, stays in your body. So in that three, session, three, hour, three times a week session, say three hours, you have to, uh, the, the team has to take out enough fluid so you can have uh, you know, sufficient uh, fluid uh, reserve so you, you know, when you drink fluid, do the say uh, drinking day-to-day -day eating and also fluid intake that it won't overcome your body's uh, lack of urination where you may wind up getting uh, uh, edematous swollen or <coughs> sort of rat because of too much fluid in the lungs. <coughs> so the fluid part is very, very important. Uh, the clearing of what we call uremic toxins, so toxin buildup because the kidneys aren't working anymore, that's also very important. <coughs> we measure that actually and then we try to make sure that we adhere to general guidelines in terms of how much toxin to build up. So it's a balance between time and efficiency versus uh, what the clinical evidence is, you know, pulling out this, the, the uh, evil humors, so to speak, um, so, so people can live healthily and uh, as long as possible. Um, then uh, finally, uh, electrolyte imbalance occurs when your kidneys aren't working. So typically, high potassium levels can occur. So any, you know, all the foods that we've been raised to say, hey, you know, this is great, very good for your health, uh, tomatoes, oranges, I just will talk about that a little more, um, avocado, seaweed, I like seaweed, um, you know, that's all potentially very dangerous for a person who uh, has failed kidneys uh, and on dialysis because you really have to be careful about that. Uh, sodium, so salt is bad for people on dialysis and not on dialysis, so, so it's even more important for those who, who are on dialysis. Okay. Due to the fact that it's almost like the way I, I put it to my patients, it's like a poison to you. And, uh, and unfortunately, society is over salted, uh, but you have to do what's best for you and really watch your diet uh, from a sodium standpoint. And there are ways to spice it up, uh, spice up food so, so it's palatable, even, on, you know, even with a renal replacement therapy. And the heparin is just basically a blood thinner to make sure the blood in the circuit uh, doesn't clot. All right, so um, speaking of the life, lifeline of dialysis, there are three different types. Okay. Uh, there's the central venous catheter, CVC for sure, AV fistula, arterial venous fistula, uh, primary uh, arterial venous fistula. And this gentleman mentioned that he had a fistula, so that, that's the best type of access. It's a natural one that lasts a long time. Um, I'll run over these uh, different type, pros and cons of each type real quickly also. So AV graft, uh, for those individuals who have, have poorer veins due to you know, life circumstances, hospitalizations, um, we re the surgeon can put in a, uh, uh, basically a plastic tube between the artery, which is the red line there, and the blue line. Uh, and creates sort of a high flow circuit. So the, the pump speed uh, in your body has to be real fast in order for the, the machine, the artificial kidney, to, to get enough blood out, clean the blood out, and take out fluid and so forth, uh, and then put it back in. So there, and the catheter, uh, of course, is the, um, the quickest way of doing things uh, if you had an emergency. But um, from a clinical study standpoint, from, from evidence-based standpoint, the worst type of uh, dialysis that you can provide statistically uh, due to the fact that uh, you know the good news is that well yeah you can just stick it, stick in a dialysis catheter usually in the internal jugular vein 
and you can start dialyzing if it's an emergency. We have done that, unfortunately, a lot. And uh, I'd say about, 50, according to the statistics, 50% of patients start emergently, so you know, on an emergency basis due to various reasons. So, so they usually wind up getting a hemodialysis catheter. So hemodialysis catheters are, uh, are, are more susceptible to infection because it's basically a type to you know, main, main blood vessel of your body and due to skin bacteria, it can seep in pretty easily. Yes. Is that a, referred to as a permacat? Yes, so there are different See, I didn't know what you were talking about. Okay. Yeah. So, so there are different terminologies. Uh, so permcath or permacath, it's actually a brand. So like Kleenex and tissues, it's also sort of synonymous. So, so yes, so exactly, permcath or permacath. Okay. There are temporary catheters also. So in a real emergency situation where you can't go to, say, an uh, interventional suite or, or uh, the OR, the operating room, uh, then they can put it in by the bedside. It's a temporary catheter. It needs to be changed uh, ASAP, basically. Um, so the AV graft, again, uh, used to be more of a standard, but then we realized over time that it was less durable, uh, had more complications like infections also, but not as bad as the catheter, because it's, it is under the skin. So there's a little layer of protection there. Um, and, and it causes, uh, it tends to thrombose more, so it clots up more. So you have to you know, try to unplug it through different ways. Uh, and then over time, it sort of just loses function, and then you have to go to the next site. So uh, the, the good thing about the graft is that if you, put, if you have a surgeon put it in, it takes about four to six weeks before it's ready to go. So it can be used pretty quickly. And then the AV fistula is uh, all natural. So it takes a vein and an artery. Uh, the surgeon typically connects it. It becomes like a high flow pipe. But it does take time to mature, um, typically up to three or more months. So that's why it's important to, to really see the nephrologist and the chronic kidney disease team to make sure that you have timely access placement if you wanted to do hemodialysis, whether in center or home hemodialysis. Okay? So it takes many months. Sometimes there, there are failures in the sense that the, the veins don't mature to the point where we can actually use it for dialysis. So they may need to have it revised. So the surgeon may need to do another procedure um, to, to make sure that it uh, gets big enough so we can actually uh, stick the needles into the, uh, the fistula. The fistula. <coughs> it is the mo most durable uh, all natural, most durable of all internal accesses. Okay, so um, this is uh, so this uh, initiative called uh, Fistula First was launched probably about eight nine years ago now, where we noticed that the evidence the, in the nephrology community um, fistulas are way better. So so over time they've been trying to educate the dialysis team, the nephrologists that that we should really, and of course the surgeons that we should really go for the fistula, to create the fistula, take the time, take the uh, effort to do that, even though it does take more time to mature. So, so it's been shown to, to uh, work the, the, the longest and also have the less, least complication rate. So, but it's required um, a lot of education um, in the community, so so. But over time, we've seen the numbers improve. Uh, I've seen it in my clinic. I've seen it in uh, in U.S. RDS data. So so we are doing the right thing for patients. Uh, it, it does take time, you know, like anything else, uh, and and continued re-education. So let's talk about the uh, let's talk about in-center hemodialysis. All right. So back in the day, uh, here's another picture of the person getting dialysis through a cough dialyzer and uh, a dialysis nurse also back in the day. And this is more a more modern uh, picture. Uh, this is actually from a dialysis, in-center dialysis clinic in Nevada, so it has a um, southwestern motif. Yeah, so it can be uh, pretty pleasant on the eyes. Now, uh, in terms of let's look at in-center hemodialysis and sort of the hours of operation. Um, uh, so anyway, usually uh, people come in at six, so there are three or four different shifts depending on the size of the dialysis unit. 
uh, and, and the, uh, it's a 12 hour sort of uh, clinic typically, Monday through Saturday. Sunday, most people are off, um, except the people on nocturnal hemodialysis in center, they dialyze Tuesday, Thursday, and Sunday. So uh, I can speak for myself, uh, our hours of operation at Daily City are probably in the range, uh, it's more in the range of 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. or so. Uh, in fact, uh, team, you know, the DeVita teammates, uh, the DeVita employees have to come in from about 4.30 or 5 to, to set up. And, and then uh, people have different shifts, uh, so typically three or four shifts of patients, and then also uh, uh, caretakers. Usually two, two shifts of caretakers probably in the center. Uh, and then, so there are different number of chairs in, uh, in the nation, uh, 16 to 34 typically is sort of the range of how many dialysis chairs and dialysis machines where people come in. So 16 to 34 people uh, per session that come in for treatment to get you know their blood washed out. Uh, there, there are clinics that are up to like 50 chairs. So uh, unfortunately, due to the increasing <coughs> incidence and prevalence of kidney failure, uh, there has been a capacity uh, issue. Um, so there are a whole host of different individuals who uh, take care of uh, the dialysis patient. Um, obviously, it's a team effort, both whether at home or or in the center. But we certainly rely. You know, I can speak for myself. I certainly rely on my dialysis nurses, uh, PCT for patient care technicians, dietitians, social workers. Uh, the facility administrator, or as it's called, the Vita, uh, and also the administrative staff to sort of keep the uh, keep the uh, place running. Uh, they also help the, our patients um, understand a little bit more about their condition, the diet, and how important that is to maintain health, the importance of taking your medications as best as possible. Uh, they, they do a lot of the education for it, and you know, I'm personally uh, grateful for them. Uh, so here's a, a typical uh, dialysis uh, unit. Uh, I believe this is in the area, but I'm not 100% sure. Uh, so these are also Fresenius. They happen to be Fresenius machines. Uh, lazy boy chairs. Uh, um, and, you know, well lit. Uh, they're, again, 16 to 34 uh, stations uh, per, per uh, dialysis center. Uh, more close up, here's a dialysis station. So you have the lazy board chair, you have uh, the uh, dialysis machine. The dialyzer isn't there. The circuitry is not placed, hasn't been placed yet. Uh, typically there's a TV, um, you know, cable TV. Okay, so here we are. So uh, for those uh, who need uh, isolation, we have special stations. For those that have uh, bloodborne pathogens, you know, uh, typically that only involves folks who have hepatitis B, as in boy. Oh, actually, I was going to play a video, but I realized that the video uh, was not going to, uh, uh, well, wasn't going to be effective for this talk. So, but it's basically a YouTube video. If you type in in center hemodialysis. Um, it basically goes through why this particular person, or why people in general, go through and choose in-center hemodialysis versus, say, one of the home therapies. Uh, I thought it was uh, very uh, interesting and enlightening. There are also you can find all sorts of different clips on, you know, uh, home hemodialysis, peritoneal dialysis, also. In addition to, of course, Davida's uh, website. Okay, so. Um, how do we keep our patients healthy? Uh, well, we, we have uh, a lot of uh, evidence-based and also um, opinion-based guidelines. So uh, we're not just sort of practicing in the dark ages these days. There are different studies that, and recommendations that have occurred over the years uh, where we know this is probably the best for our patients who need dialysis. And, and there are certain numbers, it's very numbers oriented. So, so nephrology and kidney care is very uh, numbers oriented. So we try to hit the numbers, so to speak, uh, so we can provide the best care to our patients. Uh, adequacy, so how much toxin uh, removal um, is provided per session in, in, in center hemodialysis. 
hemoglobin. So people have anemia. You know, uh, so those who have chronic kidney disease, whether on dialysis or not, have anemia. So we also have different uh, quality outcomes for, for uh, hemoglobin or anemia management. Calcium, phosphorus, uh, I'm sure anybody on uh, dialysis uh, has, uh, spoken to, have spoken to their, their dietitian about calcium and phosphorus, taking those binders, watching what they eat, uh, and dry weight. So the right amount of fluid that one takes off, uh, or the set weight for patients not to get in trouble. So they want to say, try to prevent them from going to the hospital because they have uh, pulmonary edema or too much fluid in the lungs. But also, not dry them out, so to speak, uh, to the point where they're, you know, dizzy and lightheaded. It, there's a, uh, admittedly, there, there is a defin strict definition of what the dry weight is, but there's a lot of art and science to this. So I just wanted to share some basic uh, landmark studies uh, real briefly. So before 1981, we didn't really know how much dialysis that people needed uh, until the National Cooperative Dialysis Trial. Um, they basically took, the investigators took 151 patients, uh, they, they, did, they measured uh, BUN, blood urea nitrogen, as an indicator of how much toxin buildup uh, an individual has with kidney failure, and that's what we still do, it's a urea-based uh, formula. And we try to make sure that, uh, so they didn't know at the time, so they had four categories of patients, four different urea um, levels, and then also different time periods on dialysis, two and a half to, uh, I think, four and a half hours of di hemodialysis. So they were doing basically intermittent dialysis. And th uh, this study gave us uh, guidance in terms of, hey, you know, this person needs, you know, X amount of dialysis, X amount of hours and minutes for, of dialysis so they can achieve the appropriate clearance. Now, uh, there have been of course, a lot of other trials since then, but, but basically this is sort of one of the key landmark trials that help the, the kidney community, the dialysis community, um, take care of uh, their patients as uh, best as possible. And so you, you know, for the, those folks on dialysis, you may hear KT over V or urea reduction ratio, URR, and still the uh, sort of the standard at this point in terms of making sure our patients live as long as possible and as healthily as possible. So why is calcium and phosphorus important? Uh, you know, I think uh, pictures <coughs> speaks a thousand words. Uh, so our patients have trouble excreting um, <coughs> fluid, but also they have trouble with electrolytes. I mentioned potassium and sodium, but also other ones include calcium and phosphorus. They also have trouble excreting calcium and phosphorus. So anything one takes in has phosphorus. You know, uh, we often recommend you know more protein in, in our dialysis patients, but protein has phosphorus. So, so we 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 have a strategy where we uh, give uh, medicines to to lower the intake of phosphorus in the body, so these occurrences won't happen. So this is a uh, calcified shoulder. So the calcium and the phosphorus, you know, in in our longer term patients, uh, and also for those who don't don't have uh, well controlled. Phosph calcium and phosphorus levels, they can precipitate in soft tissues, the lungs, and the vascular system, so this is the blood vessel, and this is calcium, basically. Uh, and then even in the skin, this is a, a condition, uh, it's a beginning of a condition called calciphylaxis, which is a, uh, it's a very um, serious condition, uh, and potentially uh, more fatal. So uh, we've known since the 90s uh, that phosphorus control is very important. There are strong associations of um, high phosphorus and death, uh, and it's been reproduced retrospectively since then. Okay. So just to briefly run over, um, you know, dialysis issues, uh, complications, or lifestyle changes that one needs to have. Uh, during the treatment, as you can tell here, low blood pressure can occur because you're, you're basically uh, trying to replace the kidneys, and the kidneys used to work 24-7. Now, we're talking about three hours per session, three times a week, so we have to really rev up the uh, cleaning and the fluid removal, so one can experience low blood pressure. 
Uh, that's why there has been a lot of thought in terms of extending the time. Yes, it's more inconvenient, but probably physiologically makes sense. There's more and more evidence that longer dialysis is better for patients, or more frequent dialysis is better. So, so also to avoid symptoms like low blood pressure and muscle cramps. Uh, infection and clotting typically, uh, well, infections occur uh, both from an access standpoint, so whether a catheter, which is more likely, or, or a fistula graft, but also people get other types of infections um, like pneumonia, uh, even urinary tract infections, cellulitis or skin infections. These are individuals, oftentimes they have diabetes, so they are more prone to other types of infections. And then itching, uh, what we call uremic pruritus. Uh, it's just a fancy word of saying uh, itching uh, when you have kidney disease or kidney failure. And then outside the treatment, so you, you know, one does their session and then one has to also take care of their health outside of the unit. So limited diet, um, fluid intake, because for many, if not most people, they don't urinate much. So anything you take in will stay in. Phosphorus binders, uh, very important uh, in our, you know, our care of our patients. Uh, kidney vitamins, because um, dialysis uh, also takes out water-soluble vitamins and we have to replace the uh, water-soluble vitamins with uh, primarily uh, we'll call vitamin B complex with C. There are different formulations on the market, uh, but uh, uh, basically the same principle. We're trying to replace what we're taking out on, on dialysis. So um, another challenge in the 21st century uh, that we've uh, become uh, more appreciative of and trying to take action against, access infection. So here's an individual with a tunnel hemodialysis catheter. It's in the right side, so it's the right internal jugular catheter. Um, I don't believe he's actually having an infection, but just wanted to uh, show you uh, a little more about it. You know, in depth, a little larger picture of what it looks like <coughs> for those that aren't on dialysis and don't have a catheter. And then, of course, the AD graft uh, is a is a foreign substance, uh, usually a plastic, a, a PTFE, is known as typically. Uh, it's under the skin. Yes, it's it's safer than the catheter, but uh, when one is accessing, when, when either the, the patient, <coughs> say if you're doing home hemodialysis, or a patient care technician or nurse is accessing your catheter, despite taking uh, universal precautions, you know, antimicrobials on the skin, the infection rate is higher than the natural type, the AB fistula. Due to the fact that it is a foreign substance, yes, under the skin, but still can uh, uh, predispose one to higher rates of infection. So typically these are skin bacteria, Staphylococcus aureus or Streptococcus. Uh, species, and uh, but it can be any sort of bacteria. Okay, so Hilbert, uh, again, picture speaks a thousand words, so that's what our patients have to face uh, day in and day out. Uh, we, um, we in the kidney community, including uh, those who manufacture medicines, try to make these medicines as efficient as possible, but still a uh, long ways to go. Okay, so let's talk about uh, improving outcomes and what sort of, uh, just a few brief slides on uh, what has happened and what I foresee. Okay, so this is uh, a, a landmark New England Journal of Medicine study uh, just published uh, about uh, nine months ago. Um, the FHN group is the Frequent Hemodialysis Network trial group. Actually, a lot of the uh, physicians were actually in the area. I don't know if anybody knows Glenn Chertow from Stanford, uh, George Ting from El Camino. Uh, they're uh, big proponents of more frequent and longer dialysis. Um, uh, so this is uh, one of the uh, studies where it, sh it was shown that um, about, there were about 250 patients or so enrolled uh, six times a week in center hemodialysis, which is uh, very hard to do due to uh, technical and economic reasons, versus standard three times a week. So, um, and it was a positive trial, meaning they did show difference in outcomes. So the six times a week in-center hemodialysis patients did better, 
they, they, they did, uh, you know, like any study, they picked different points. Um, they picked two different primary endpoints, lower death rate or improved LV mass. LV is left ventricular mass. So the heart, so 80% of patients coming into dialysis have a thick heart due to high blood pressure, probably too much fluid in their system, and it's sort of like any muscle, the more you use it, the thicker it gets. Of course, this type of thickness, this type of uh, muscle buildup is not a good thing, and it's been shown that people have worse outcomes when they have thick heart muscle, which is called left ventricular hypertrophy. So uh, the six times a week patient, uh, patient population did better from a death rate standpoint or an improved uh, left ventricular heart mass standpoint. They felt these were important outcomes uh, that affected patients longer term. They also showed uh, lower death rate, and they combined it with uh, improvement in sort of physical health score, almost like quality of life standpoint. So that was also positive for the six times a week in-center hemodialysis patient population. Um, you know, they're, they're, like any trial, there are different interpretations. There are also um, regulatory factors that the government probably has to take a look at. But it was very promising uh, uh, in the sense that perhaps what we've been thinking about traditionally, three times a week hemodialysis, may not be best short three times a week hemodialysis, may be not the best thing for our patients. And so what do I see in the future? Uh, I see, uh, uh, again, this is primarily an in-center hemodialysis time. I see more patients doing more frequent, longer dialysis at home, perhaps, as a next stage machine, uh, so you can actually bring it home. I see more people uh, doing peritoneal dialysis. We didn't talk much about peritoneal dialysis, but that has become more um, popular these days, especially for those individuals that just start uh, renal replacement or kidney dialysis therapy. Uh, it's, there's some promising trials saying that people do a little better over the first two years of uh, their, their end-stage renal disease career, so to speak. And, and of course, transplant statistically is the best option, but we always think about how we can get them to the next level. Um, I, I sometimes tell my patients, okay, you know, this is just the transition period, uh, purgatory, if you want to call it that, um, and that we, our job as the team is to try to get you to the next level, you know, um, get, get you listed early, even before dialysis. Um, think about different options that fit your lifestyle needs, plus, you know, what's more likely to help you transition to the next level healthily and happily. Uh, and then uh, also uh, nocturnal dialysis, whether in center or at home, I think is very promising. I, I see um, if as the clinical outcomes come about and are published, um, our community will probably, uh, you know, be more of a proponent for that type of longer, slower, gentler dialysis therapy in order to keep our patients uh, more healthy, and uh, and potentially to to kidney transplant. Okay, so uh, I'd like to conclude by the following. Um, as I've shown you, um, ESRD, end stage renal disease or end stage kidney disease, uh, the population continues to grow, and there are both societal and economic implications that we have to uh, come to grips with as a, as a country, as, as the world. Uh, and center hemodialysis, uh, is, you know, traditional and center hemodialysis is still the most popular uh, for those individuals in the U.S. It does vary different countries, you know, uh, as I mentioned, 92% of our patients start with uh, hemodialysis, typically in center. Uh, if you look at certain other populations, say in Asia, you know, 40% are on peritoneal dialysis. So, uh, in fact, Hong Kong, I think, is like 70% uh, peritoneal dialysis, 70 or 80% peritoneal dialysis. So, um, you know, there, there are implications there, and, and I think uh, as the evidence comes out, um, you know, as uh, more uh, regulations come out, we may uh, have more people dialyzing at home. I foresee that. Uh, and 
significant technological advances have occurred since uh, Dr. Kalf today, and, and many of our uh, equipment plus you know, clinical trials have improved our patients' outcomes. But uh, of course, uh, and this is the clinical trial uh, part, uh, and medical advancement is of course important in any field. And then uh, despite uh, all the improvements, uh, we still have a lot of challenges uh, ahead for our community and for our patients. The end. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
different types of, I think there was a question before the talk about where, where um, a patient can go. They can go to any dialysis unit. If they choose in-center hemodialysis or home dialysis, uh, they can go to any center they choose. Uh, typically, a person would choose due to geography. You know, for example, if someone lives in Daly City, they're not going to go to dialysis in Palo Alto three times a week, and uh, or or across the bridge. Uh, now, uh, of course, if you're doing it at home, uh, it, there's a little more flexibility. Uh, you know, re regarding training, since most of the action, so to speak, uh, happens at home. Let's talk about. Um, I guess the uh, vascular access cycle of a uh, person on hemodialysis. So uh, we typically put in fistulas. So I mean, I've, had, I've had patients on hemodialysis for 35 years, is my, is my record. Uh, so yes, access becomes a problem as time progresses. Uh, so we first use up the forearms, so the non-dominant uh, arm, and then we go typically to the upper arm. Then uh, we can also put in a graft, plastic material there. And then we have the other arm, same thing. And then the groin, uh, typically, uh, so the femoral artery, so you can put in a graft or a fistula. So say those give out. Uh, then we have a couple of options these days. Um, there are other alternative graft sites. Um, and also, uh, there, there is perma the permanent catheter, which we would like to avoid based on uh, the clinical data that's out there. Um, there have been a couple of de novel devices over the years, uh, actually recently uh, developed uh, a so-called HERO device, which uh, one could potentially be a candidate for. So we're trying to H-E-R-O, like HERO, um, and that's in some ways like a graft, but it doesn't involve um, the, the, uh, the larger flow uh, veins or arteries uh, in, in a sense. So we are looking into anybody with a, with a potential permanent catheter to, to look uh, to potentially get a so-called hero device. Then uh, there are other um, types of catheters that you're, so sometimes people also wear out their internal jugular subclavian vein. So we're, we're talking about a femoral catheter, which is sort of the dirtiest area of the body. Um, and we try to avoid that. Now, I have one person on that, unfortunately. Uh, so we, at that point, we would look into uh, also, uh, we mustn't forget peritoneal dialysis. In general, I think about perineal dialysis uh, more these days, uh, but, but um, if they already tried peritoneal dialysis or are incapable of doing peritoneal dialysis at home, then the hero device would be an option. Uh, transplant is, of course, another option that we should have looked as a healthcare team, as part of the healthcare team, we would have looked into ASAP or even before dialysis, if I had the luxury of meeting about him or her before dialysis. Peritoneal dialysis, uh, typically if one has had um, multiple bowel surgeries uh, or, or say uh, intra-abdominal processes, malignancies, cancers, uh, one would uh, say the team would probably, and the nephrologist would probably advise against that situation. Um, traditionally, if they had um, poorly controlled diabetes, uh, one would probably consider avoiding it, but, but we do have some novel solutions uh, out there for peritoneal dialysis that doesn't include sugar, or includes less sugar, so we would consider that now more than before. Um, so anything that, if you've been cut multiple times in, 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 uh, in the uh, peritoneal, in the front, then we would probably less likely choose that option. Of course, there's also a home situation, uh, uh, psychosocial it, issues that may arise if they live in a skilled nursing facility, uh, obviously we can't do peritoneal dialysis. Okay. So, so there are other, so in terms of hemodialysis, um, one can always do hemodialysis with a catheter, of course that would be the worst option. In terms of uh, putting in a, uh, a shunt or a fistula or graft, um, you know, rarely, uh, well if they have really poor veins, they may not be can or they've been used up. They may not be able to have a graft or fistula plate. <coughs> Sometimes people with bad congestive heart failure, um, uh, I'd say it's not a uh, script contraindication, but one has to be cautious about those individuals uh, and uh, heart, uh, heart, high output heart failure. So when you're creating a fistula, 
It's a high flow pipe of blood, and it may take out more blood than you'd like if you had a condition called congestive heart failure or CHF. The other thing is sometimes people, when we create these fistulas or grafts, they can have a, an arterial steal syndrome, S-T-A-L syndrome, where you're stealing the blood from the hand and it causes major problems on the, uh, of the hand. So these are complications more than, uh, than strict contraindications. If you have a well-maintained calcium phosphorus uh, balance, you can uh, slow down and, uh, again, based on the few randomized clinical trials that are out there using uh, electron beam CT scanning, so they could actually tell how much calcification there is uh, over time. Um, you can reverse it to a certain extent. Um, a lot of the uh, damage has been done over the years, um, but one can slow it down definitely with uh, adequate uh, uh, or optimal uh, phosphate control. Uh, some people, uh, there, there are some recommendations about uh, avoiding uh, excess calcium intake, which I personally practice based on National Kidney Foundation guidelines, um, you know, using um, primarily non-phosphate, sorry, non-calcium phosphate binders, so using more of the, uh, I also don't own any uh, Renagel stock or Renvella stock, but Renvella or Renagel, Phosphorinol, um, rather than Tums, calcium acetate, or also known as Foslo. Uh, but I think the most important thing is probably controlling the numbers first. Uh, in my personal practice, I try to avoid excess calcium phosphate, phosphate binder uh, use. Um, sparingly, not at all. And then we, I think uh, uh, the, the whole other issue about parathyroid hormone uh, control. Uh, I think the jury's still out, but one can potentially uh, limit the vascular calcification there by controlling that issue too. Thank you. Thank you all for such a wonderful question.